going to have three little, little mini messages as we go through. Um, so please do pay attention. Kids, in a few minutes, we've got a game for you. So pay attention, and then we'll play a game in a bit. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you. Joe and I have got COVID and uh, have been uh, kind of stuck at home. Uh, we didn't want to spread it around, but we did want to play a part in what is uh, a fantastic morning. 15 years of journeying together and you've made our, our, our work a joy and uh, we love you so much. And, um, and also celebrating all that we are as a church from across the nations of the world gathering here in Southampton. It's such a thrill to see all that you're becoming and we're so proud of you. And, uh, but I just wanted to uh, just look at the scripture the opening bit of the scripture that we've just had read to us from uh, Paul writing to the Ephesians. And uh, as, as uh, it's a, a wonderful passage we've just heard, all about God's attitude to, to cultural divides. And Paul introduces himself in the context of his unique role in God's plan for the Gentiles, those non-Jews. And he describes himself as an apostle to the Gentiles. You see, Jesus' death and resurrection had ushered in a whole new day where the dividing walls of hostility between Jews and Gentiles had now been broken down forever. And in, in the church, a new society was inaugurated where it was no longer to do whether you were a, a Jew or you were a Gentile or you were, you were rich or you were poor or you were black or you were white. And I want you to understand this would have been a massive thing for both the Jews and for the Gentiles to embrace. The Jews who had always been the exclusive people of God, suddenly allowing these foreigners to become part of the family. You see, Israel's exclusivity had now gone and peace with God was now on offer, not just to the Jews, but to everyone. You see, Israel didn't like this message, which was what led to Paul being in prison which is where he wrote this from. You can read in the book of Acts how Paul was teaching everywhere about this, this new society that Jesus had inaugurated. And because of that, uh, he was arrested. And we pick up the story today in Ephesians where Paul is quite literally in prison, which is where I want to speak to you for a moment about catfish. Now, <coughs> bear with me. In the northeastern United States, cod fishing is a massive commercial business and cod from that area is in demand all over America. But for the shippers of the cod, this caused a real problem. How were they to keep cod fresh on the long journey to its destination? So they tried to solve the problem. First, they froze it instantly and then shipped it. But the freezing seemed to take away a lot of the flavor of this beautiful cod. So they decided, well, let's ship them alive in, in tanks of seawater. Um, but that ended up being even worse. Um, it was expensive, um, but the cod still lost its flavor because the, 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 the fish were in this tank, but they were inactive and their, f their flesh became all mushy and soft and, and, and not the delicacy that it should be. And interestingly, this is how they solved the problem. They put the cod in the tank of seawater with a catfish. Now, the catfish is the natural enemy of the cod. So for the whole journey up the coast, the catfish would chase the cod all around the tank. And when it arrived at its destination, it was fitter and healthier than it would, had ever been. And uh, certainly as tasty as the day it was caught. And sometimes it was even better. Obviously then it was killed and eaten, so it wasn't any good then. But it was, it, it was, it was the, the, the enemy that came in that actually improved the, 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 the flavor and the texture of the catfish. And here we pick up Paul, quite literally in a tank with catfish. He's in prison. And from the moment he'd first met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, his life had been one of trial and one of challenge. And in the opening verses today, he even describes himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Isn't that an interesting phrase? So he's caught in a tank by Jesus. It doesn't sound great. Well, in reality, he was a prisoner of Nero, the emperor, but Paul never thought of things in purely earthly, human way. Paul knew that God was sovereign. He knew that God was in overall control of every event in the cosmos. So whether he was preaching in Athens or on trial in front of the Roman authorities, or whether he was shipwrecked on Malta or under arrest in Rome, he knew that it all came under 
the lordship of Jesus. And I would go as far as to say that because Paul had learned to be so personally confident of God and content in every situation, even in the tank, that gave him great liberty and it gave him great strength. His character was developed. He became more robust. He became more godly as he faced trials of every kind because he knew that God was in control and he was then liberated from every fear and every worry. So Paul was quite literally in a tank, quite literally imprisoned in Rome. But you know, you and I are also in a tank. There are certain inescapable circumstances that surround us. I mean, we've been shut in with COVID. That's one thing we've all experienced. That It's a, it's a, a limiter on our circumstances. But not only are there challenging circumstances around, but there are also God's appointed catfish enemy activity, trials that just leave you feel like you're being chased around, sometimes snapped at, not able to really settle. You know those sets of circumstances that aggravate us, that frustrate us, that disappoint us and that hurt us. You see, like Paul, if we're going to start to model this new humanity, we need to understand that these circumstances that each of us will face, these trials that snap at our fins are there for our own health, and they're there for our own vigour. There is no circumstance that we face that is not ordained or allowed by God. You understand that? There is no circumstance that we face that is not ordained or at least allowed by God. God is in control, and he will use these trials for our good as we face challenges. They make us stronger, and they make us Fitter. This is what Paul said to the Philippians in Philippians 4, verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And James in James 1 said this Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And then most famously to the Romans, Paul said this, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character and character, hope and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So if like me you're facing a trial at the moment, I want you to learn to thank God for the catfish. I want you to learn to thank God for the tank. I want you to try and discern what God is teaching you in it and how it's strengthening you and I want you to be liberated from any anxiety or worry, whether it's the, the, the tank you're in, the circumstances that surround you, or the catfish, those challenging things in life that come your way. It's for your good. I want you to say this with me. God is in control of my life. Say it for me. God is in control of my life. Say, I do not need to worry. I do not need to worry. The catfish are doing me good. The catfish are doing me good. God bless you. You'll pick up some more with the other elders as we carry on this morning's meeting, but I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Remember, the catfish are doing you good. God bless. See you soon. As if it, as if it wasn't enough of a mystery already that God, like Chris was saying, would grow us and do us good through trouble, Paul in these passages keeps talking about another mystery, doesn't he? Those, well, those four verses we've just had read are all talking about another mystery. What is the mystery that Paul is talking about? What is this mystery the Bible is talking about? In some ways, the word mystery is kind of unhelpful because when we hear the word mystery today, we, we think of something that, well, hey, it's just a mystery. It can't be explained. It can't be understood. That's not quite the way the Bible is talking about mystery here. The Bible is talking more like more like the word secret, really, 
But as we heard in one of those verses, it's a secret, it's a mystery that has been made known. Hey, this is what I mean. Uh, I need two volunteers to explain what I mean. Throw up a hand, throw up a hand. Yeah, one, that'll do, come on, have you come? One more volunteer. Let's have somebody a bit older. Somebody a bit older to volunteer. Yeah, come on then, yeah. Great, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you two a secret, okay? And then you two will know the secret, okay? Now, nobody else is listening as I tell you the secret, okay? No one else is listening. The secret is God loves you, okay? Now, here's what you need to do. You need to go and get one other person in the room, and you need to tell them what I just told you and then bring them back over here, okay? Okay, now you four all know the secret that God loves you. So what you now need to do is all go and get one person, tell them that secret and bring them back. But this time, it's got to be a grown-up. Go. Okay, now you all know the secret that God loves you. So now you all need to go tell one person each that God loves you and bring them back here. Go, fast, fast, fast. In case you're wondering about being on camera as ever-increasing numbers of people are joining us, the camera has just panned up, so not everyone's going to be on now. Okay, now you guys all know the secret. Now what you all need to do, can you guess, is go out, find one person each, tell them God loves you, and bring them back here. Go, now, let's go. Do you think I dare? Do you think I dare? You're right, I do. All right, everyone, go. One person, tell them the secret, bring them back. Let's go. Great work, people. You have been doing what that passage is talking about, telling people the mystery that God was talking about, the mystery, the secret that God made known that God loves us. You can all take a seat now and go back again. We won't keep going forever. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. When, when the way Paul explained what that secret is, what that mystery that God loves you is, is he put it like this in verse 6. The mystery, the, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the same promise as Christ Jesus through the gospel. What that means is it, it matters it matters, it, it wasn't just an exercise in you go out into the room and tell people that God loves you, but you've got to bring them back. That everybody who hears and believes in that same gospel good news is made part of the same family. That if you believe in the gospel, the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, his perfect life, his atoning death, and his hope-giving resurrection, then you are part of the same family. That the The dividing walls between anyone are broken by that good news that the mystery of the gospel has done that. That everybody who is a Christian is part of the same body that Jesus is the head of. That everybody who is a Christian is part of the same temple that Jesus lives in. And that means that we have this incredible good news, this mystery that has been made known to us. We did how many times do you think we did that then? Did anyone keep count? Maybe did it four or five times. How many times do you think we would have to do that for everyone in the world to know the good news of the gospel and to be brought into the church? Who? Somebody got it right then, you nerd. 33. You do that 33 times and everyone in the world would know the gospel and be part of the family of God. That... That means, that means that the church is the body of people who believe this. And do you know what that gives us? That gives us so many things. That, that helps us break the cycle of consumerism in the church because it means that the church is Jesus' thing, it's not my thing. And so it's about what it gives to Jesus, not what it, about it gives to me. It prevents us from despair because it gives us a reason to live for, something to belong to. It helps keep us humble because we know that nobody deserves or owns the church, but that everybody has come into the church through the grace of Jesus Christ. 
It gives us an incredible security because it means we belong, not because we're, we're good at being Christians, but we belong because God is good at saving people. And it gives us a reason to press on. Only 33 times and the whole world would know. So, I don't know if you are looking at me and thinking from last week you look a bit different, but that's because on Friday I went for a haircut, which quite frankly was a disappointing haircut. Um, and you, you, can, you can come and inspect why, but it's a little bit wonky on one side, but it was also because I was trying to deal with Theo, our youngest, who is two. So we both went and had our haircut in an Italian barbershop with my hair being cut by an Iraqi Turkish guy. And uh, meanwhile, we were also having a conversation with a Syrian barber who was next to us. And we were chatting about all the things that are wrong with the world, and he was telling me what we needed to do to fix them. Okay, that's, that's how the kind of conversation went. Theo mainly just ate mini cheddars. He contributed very little to the conversation, frankly. But we were talking about what was going on, and honestly, it's a similar conversation I have every time I go into the barbers. Um, I don't know about you, gents. Maybe, ladies, it's a different kind of experience. I don't know. But it's like you, you cover all of the important things when you go to the barbers. Um, so, like, why is there so much turmoil in the world? Why, why can't we just be more tolerant? Why can't we just be friends with each other, let everyone get on with their own thing, and all just get on with life? That was his kind of solution. And I was like, yeah, okay, not, not a bad point. But it seems so simple, doesn't it? But if it was as simple as, let's all just get along with each other and let's all be nice, then why is it, kids, in your class that people fall out? Put your hand up for me if someone in your class has fallen out recently. Yeah, had difficulties in their friendships and things like that. Teachers are nodding like, yes, every day. Absolutely. What about for you, maybe at work, maybe it's why, why you're, think, you're thinking, why can't my colleagues just get along with each other? Surely we just can all get along, can't we? What about your neighbours? Have you got any neighbours on your road that just don't seem to be able to sort it out? Maybe? Clarks, your neighbours. Are they ropey? Maybe even you look at it a little bit wider and you think, these world leaders, why can't, why can't everyone just get along? Why can't it be that easy? The problem is that division and disunity are everywhere. It's difficult, isn't it? Maybe even this morning you came in and thought to yourself, well, there's no way I'm going to sit over there with them. I'll sit over here with these people. Maybe not. I hope not in live church, but you never know. But you see, when we see division and disunity everywhere in our world, when there's something different, it really stands out, doesn't it? When we see something different to division, it really, really stands out. And I think that is what is happening as we build church. So as we build church here, as we serve Jesus, and we have done for the last 15 years, it, it shows something different to the world around us. And that is what we see in this verse, in Ephesians 3, verse 10. As we build Christ's visible church, something else is also taking place. So in verse 10, as we just had read to us from all sorts of different languages, we see one of the reasons why Jesus is building this incredible church. It says his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Say the word manifold for me. Manifold. Kids, join in. Say the word manifold. Manifold. What does the word manifold mean? If you're a mechanic, it might mean one thing. But in this context, it means something quite different. So Paul is helping us to see the incredible nature of the church. So this, this new revelation that we've heard about this morning, that everyone is included, even you, whoever you are. I, I, I know I can say that. Even you are included, whoever you are, because of the way Jesus has made things. And you see, this gospel affected everyone. It didn't just affect Paul, who wrote this letter. But he was, he was talking to, to Jewish people, and previously the people of God had been just them. And now everything had changed. It not only affected him and, and the people around him, but it has affected everyone for the last 2,000 years of history who have come to faith in God through Jesus Christ. It is this, this, this new supernatural society of people brought together because of one man. That is an incredible thing, isn't it? Just look around you for a moment. Just look around you. There's nowhere else like this. There's nowhere else like this. And you might be thinking, thank goodness, I'm going to have to do it once a week. 
But there's nowhere else like the church on earth. And it's only through the work and the, the rule of Jesus Christ. And you see, Paul is also telling us, though, that the, the church is not just visible to the people who might sort of be listening in from Wilton Road or something like that. It's also demonstrating something to the, to the realms that are unseen. It says the rulers and authority in the heavenly realms. So what does the church demonstrate then? You might have had that question before. What's the church about? What does the church demonstrate? Well, this word manifold, it literally means multicolored. The multicolored wisdom of God. And it's, as you can see, this, this, this kind of technicolor tapestry of people in this room, people across the world that make up the church. And our little part of it here called Life Church. All of these different strands from every walk of life, every background, every race, every tongue and tribe, every, every socioeconomic background, every culture, every race. And you know what? Just like a tapestry, sometimes if you're right in the middle of it, it can look a bit of a mess, can't it? If you've been around the church for any length of time, you'll look at, you might be in it and you might think, God, you know what? The church, if, if the church could just sort itself out, it could probably do something. But have you ever looked at the back of a tapestry? All the threads going in different directions, here, there, and everywhere, and it looks an absolute mess. And yet, if you step back from it and you look, it creates something beautiful. And that is what the church is. To those looking on, both in the physical world and in the unseen spiritual world, it, the church is something unbelievable. We need to get this in our hearts because we are part of something incredible. Now, this isn't the same as kind of multicultural Britain, especially in a multicultural city like Southampton. But what happens in Britain is that we get kind of pockets of different communities, pockets of different, usually different kind of races or backgrounds, and they kind of, we kind of stick together just like near each other, but not together. Not really together. And that is something that is very different from the church. The, the church isn't just kind of different culture, just kind of wedged together by kind of economic situations. The church is this supernatural tapestry, each individual thread woven together to form this, to form something that looks quite incredible that we don't find elsewhere. Imagine just these, these people from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of different ways of thinking, cultural understandings of how the world works and how we should relate to each other, all brought together. It demonstrates God's multicolored wisdom, not only to the world, but as Paul says, to the rulers and authorities. It demonstrates this to the heavenly realms. And you might be thinking, well, what are the heavenly realms? What are the rulers and authorities that he's talking about? Ultimately, he's actually talking about spiritual beings, angels and demons. What do we make of that? How do we, how do we make sense of this? We see God... When, you, when we accept Christ Jesus into our lives, when we, when we come to him, you are made into a new creation. Do you know that? When you become a Christian, you are made brand new. And then you are brought into a new family. That is what the church is. It's a brand new family of people. And the world can see it amongst us, but God hasn't given this same revelation. He hasn't given the same status as you and me to the angels. He hasn't. They serve him because they're created beings and they are working essentially on God's behalf. And demons are not. They're doing the exact opposite of what God wants them to do. So how do they see the beauty of God? Well, this verse tells us that right now, spiritual beings are looking at this room and going, wow. 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 You and me are declaring something to the spiritual realm around us, the unseen world, that this is something incredible and this is what God has designed. Would you have designed it like this? I wouldn't. It would be so much easier if there was another way. And yet God has designed it to be just like this. You see, they can look on and they can say, wow, look at what God has done. All these people down here, look, they... They should be fighting each other. Like that person's from there and that person's from here. They, should, they shouldn't be friends. They certainly shouldn't be sitting next to each other, let alone in the same room as each other. And now they're going to eat together and they sing together and they dance together and they're learning each other's languages. And they're not, they're, they are blown away by this. Angels are looking on at us in awe. 
And demons are looking on and cursing ultimately at their own failure to keep us divided. There's an enemy who wants to keep the world divided. He would love to keep the church divided. And yet this morning we are demonstrating something of God's beautiful victory, outworked on the cross of Jesus Christ, and that stares them in the face. When we sing that he is our rescuer, we declare things to the heavenly realms around us that changes the world around us. You might think we just come here on a Sunday morning, sing some songs, do some stuff, go to kids' work, go home. We are an outpost of heaven in our city, and by meeting together, we change the climate of our city. And by churches doing this all across our world, we proclaim the name of Jesus, and his name is lifted high, as, it's, as it should be. And so what does this mean for us then? What does this mean for us as a church? Because there are all sorts of ways that people try and change the world, aren't there? There's, a, there's an idea that we can all just change the world if we just believe our dreams and do it. Maybe. Maybe. But I think what this verse tells us is something different. You see, I think politicians will look on us as a society and they will do their absolute utmost to do all they can to change things, to do things for the good. And they will cure the society of its ills and they will genuinely do their best, but will be found wanting. Charities will do incredible fundraising and they'll do wonderful things and brilliant stuff in society in an attempt to, to bring the best to those in need. The media and the press will... will cover our news pages and our, our feeds on social media with, with the problems with society and they'll let us know all the stuff that's gone wrong but they offer no solution and so we can end up feeling a little bit hopeless and yet the unique church of Jesus Christ as we are linked personally to him through faith not through our background not through our colour not through our wealth not through how clever we are this is the hope of the world. You and me. Turn to the person next to you and tell them you are the hope of the world. That's a frightening prospect, isn't it? Honestly, this, this baffles me that people like me in all of my mess, in all the ways I screw up and get things wrong and let people down and let God down and don't do all the things I should do, I am the hope of the world. Because Jesus Christ has put his light of his life inside of me. And he has done the same with you. And so together, that is what he's created us to be. A beautiful expression of who he is. And so... You know, sometimes we look and we look at the church at large and maybe it makes us cringe a little bit and we kind of think, oh gosh, I wish they wouldn't say that, do that, do this. But, but like anything, all we can do is we can, we can just do our bit. All you can do is do the bit that you're responsible for. You can follow Jesus, whether you're tiny or whether you're one of the oldest people in the room. You following Jesus faithfully will be a faithful witness to the world around us and will change things. I promise you that. We can't worry about what's happening over there. We can't worry about what's happening over there. But we can do our bit to follow Jesus and say that Life Church is going to be the place that brings life to every community. Not a franchise of Life Church. It's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. But he says that he has come life to bring us life and life to the full. And so that is what we are declaring to the world this morning. That's why we've written it on these things. And that's why we're going to sing and we are going to proclaim it to the world around us this morning. So why don't we stand together? I'm going to pray for us. And do you know, it might be that you're here this morning and you're thinking, do you know what? I'm not sure that I am actually part of that. I'm not sure I would say I've ever put my trust in Jesus. I'm not sure I could ever say, actually, I am a Christian. I'm not part of this tapestry. My, my, my thread hasn't been woven in. It can be this morning. We're going to sing the song Rescuer again. And it basically tells you the gospel. It tells you the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't put your trust in Jesus, can I encourage you, either come and find me while we're having some food or find someone that you know and today can be the day that you are woven in.
when your thread is made a part of this wonderful tapestry. And if you're thinking, I'm not sure because I feel like a bit of a mess. Well, I've just explained the whole thing's a mess. Redeemed in Jesus Christ. The whole thing is only brought together through him. You don't have to have it sorted. None of the rest of us have, but he has. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have promised that you will build your church in all of its glorious mess and that somehow you have chosen this to be the representation of what you are like to the world, to the physical world around us, to the spiritual rulers and authorities around us. You have chosen people like me to display your glory. And the dignity that that gives us, Lord, is incredible. And so we pray right now by your spirit, which you take life, church, from strength to strength, not for our sake, Lord, but for the glory of your name, that your kingdom might come and that your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. Be glorified, Lord, we pray. Amen.